Good afternoon. My name is Manuel Bermudez. I am the owner of Tutor Zone and super uh, energized and enthusiastic about this great college fair. My goal is to really help you guys understand how to navigate the process that is coming up for seniors in the next three or four months. For some of you guys who may be younger, I want you guys to really think about these things moving forward and how you can do a really great job of telling the best story about yourself. See, I think the college application process is all about figuring out a great way to tell the best story about yourself. And so how do we do that when everyone else has a 4.0 or a 1200 SAT these days? We have to be strategic about the things we do. Luckily, in my experience, I've got a chance to work with a lot of different students, different backgrounds, a lot of diversity. Um, and so I feel like I've been blessed to have good experience. I am by no means blessed with an IQ higher than anyone. I am just blessed with exposure and I hope to give it to you guys today. So let's get right to it. Let's try to figure out how to tell the best story about yourself throughout the college application process. So first of all, again, who am I? I am the founder of Tutor Zone. Um, it's been about 14 years that we've been doing this now. We're a tutoring company in Whittier, La Habra, Placentia, and Orange. So again, we have a little bit of diversity in terms of all the students we have. And so I'm gonna to try to bring different angles to this idea. I have my degree from Cal State Fullerton and Cal State Long Beach, so I am biased. I love Cal States. I think that they are great schools. It is all about what you're gonna do with it when you get there. Um, at the same time, I think we're blessed in California to have one of the best UC systems um, and so many great private schools around us. So let's navigate that. I also do teach business at the University of West LA. So it may seem like you're feeling like I'm teaching to you today, um, but hopefully I'll do a good job of engaging you in the material. Here is the most important part and the most important component of the college admissions process. It's always about your GPA first. So you're thinking, I wanted to come in today and listen to the SAT versus the ACT conversation. Hey, you're in the right room. We are gonna talk about that for sure, but let's put some context because with the SAT and ACT, that is not the end all be all, especially in these crazy moments that we're living. If you have been in tune with what's happening in the last few months, we were hit with this pandemic and the colleges had to react as well because it's unfair to say, hey, college students, you're gonna be coming into college soon. You need to make sure you take that SAT. Wait, by the way, you can't really leave your home and they're all shut down. So how does that impact us? Well, let me put it into context for you. First of all, let's focus on our GPA. And so there are two different GPAs that you could be looking at. You have your weighted and you have your unweighted GPA, and I'm gonna explain how they matter. But first of all, to have some perspective, it's good to look at your transcript and just kind of understand where your non-weighted GPA is. See, if two students are trying to get into UCLA and they both have a 4.0 unweighted, then they are on an evil uh, level playing field. Why is that? Well, you may be going to, um, La Puente High School or possibly to a private school. And the private school only offers two AP classes, but La Puente offers 10. Well, you're blessed at La Puente to have 10 different AP classes that you could take, but the student that goes to a smaller private school maybe only has two. Therefore, the La Puente student is gonna be able to increase their weighted GPA by taking more AP classes. So the only way colleges can make it fair and get everyone on the same starting point is by looking at their non-weighted GPA. Make sure when you're looking at college averages, you're looking at that one first. That kind of gives you a perspective. What is my average uh, for the college I'm trying to get into and where do I lie? By the way, the weighted is extremely important and you're gonna see that how it comes into play in the factor number two that we'll be talking about today. But again, back to GPAs. Usually if you look at your class ranking on your um, college transcript, you can look at it on your Aries or your power school you would see that maybe it tells you you are number 20 out of 100. Maybe you go to a really small school. What does that mean? That means that you're ranked in the top 20% in your class. And so why does that matter? I have a business finance degree, so I'm always trying to crunch numbers and figure out what is our percentage chance of getting in. I think it helps you too to navigate that by looking here at the bottom where it says the class rank. Usually if you're in the top 5% of your class, you really have a great shot at those extremely elite Ivy League schools like Stanford, the Pomona colleges, right? Uh, Harvard and all those Ivy League schools, those are usually the schools that they're going after. Does that mean that you're ranked sixth or seventh, you can't get in? 
Of course you can. It's just gonna take maybe finalizing and strengthening other factors. So usually traditional state schools like UCs and Cal States are taking students that range anywhere in the top 50% in their class. Again, does that mean if you're in 51% ranking you can't get in? Not at all. I'm just kind of giving you guys some generalizations and perspective for you to have an idea. But if you are 51, 52 percentile, then you got to work a little harder on some of the other factors. And so that's what that means. Great tip to know. If you are ranked in the not top 9% in your class, you are 100% guaranteed a spot into a UC. That's awesome. That means you can go to bed really comfortable once you submit your applications and say, you know what, I am at least going to a UC because I'm ranked in the top 9%, which means you still have to work hard senior year to maintain that so that no one jumps you, right? How do they figure out class ranking? It's all about based on your GPA. You have to just do better than the other 91% of your class to fall into that 9% category. So does that mean that if you apply to Berkeley, you are in for sure? Unfortunately not. That means that if you apply to UCLA and Berkeley, which are the end all be alls, everyone wants to go there, so it's crazy competitive, and you don't get in, but you're in the top 9% of your class, you will be 100% offered a spot at one of the UCs that has space. Right now, usually the UC that has space is UC Merced. If you just said UC, come on, what? Then you don't know much about Merced because it's one of the newer ones. It is somewhere in the middle of the forest. Get to know it. Start looking up the YouTube videos on it. Start going and doing the virtual tour because that's your backup. And that is a great backup. Maybe you're just not as familiar with it because most of us are familiar with Berkeley, UCLA, and San Diego. Who doesn't want to live in San Diego? Who doesn't want to live in LA? Who doesn't want to leave near San Francisco? That's usually why those schools are very heavily populated in terms of applications. So those are reach schools for most of us. All right. So again, the factor number one to pay attention is this. So pay attention to your GPA by making that the primary focus, which means if you have 50 extracurricular activities and they're making your GPA drop because you're so busy, you aren't prioritizing correctly. You want to start by prioritizing on your grades because it's the number one perspective that it is given to colleges on how you're going to do when you get to college based on your academics. Factor number two is your course rigor. Most of us think that it's your SAT and your ACT. And my guess is most of you watching me today thought that too, which is why you wanted to come into this webinar. Not to uh, shake you up too much, but I think in a good way, they care more about how rigorous, how, how difficult your course schedule is than how you do on a three hour exam. And I think that that's a good thing because it paints a picture that the last three and a half, four years of your high school career matter more than one exam. Again, I will get to that big exam, but here's what course rigor mean, means. It means the history, of your rigorous coursework. So do you decide to take honors classes or do you just take every regular college level class, which there's nothing wrong with as long as you do really well. But if you're in regular math every year and you're easily getting an A, I recommend that you step up to the challenge and you take an honors class. That does not mean that you take AP everything and honors everything. There's this B rule I recommend. And by the B rule, think about it this way. If I can get a B in an honors or an AP class, it's better than getting an A in a regular college level class. What is this guy talking about? He just told us how our GPA is the most important factor. That's right. But for the colleges, it looks like you're challenging yourself and saying, you know what, I got a B, but it was a tough B. I had to really figure out how to work hard. And that's what they love because guess what? College is gonna be rigorous. And so what colleges are saying is, they've already taken a rigorous course load, they're probably pretty close to being academically fit for our environment. Again, you can still get in with a great GPA and no AP or honors classes, but I would recommend for you to find that niche where you're really strong at, what comes a little bit easier for you. And that's why I love doing this. I love doing the college conversations because I was a Costa Rican born student. I moved here in the United States when I was nine years old, didn't speak any English for the first nine years of my life, Absolutely 100% fluent in Spanish. And guess what? Freshman year, Spanish one. Fresh uh, sophomore year, Spanish two. Getting those easy A's, just cruising. No one told me about this stuff. Unfortunately, my mom was a little too busy cleaning houses so that we could make it. 
And so I didn't have this information, which is why I want to empower you guys with a lot of this information today. Try to be strategic about things. I should have been in like AP Spanish bilingual by like freshman year. I should have been like the TA and teaching the class because I spoke Spanish for the first nine years of my life. But I didn't know that. I thought I was just cool cruising, getting that A, and that's what matters. Uh, and then obviously when I put on my application that I'm 100% bilingual, they're like, oh, really? Are you Spanish one student? You're cruising, right? So it doesn't mean take AP everything and crush your GPA. Let me tell you guys a quick little story. The most brilliant student I've ever worked with in college coaching. I have one who has a 1540 on their SAT, practically almost perfect. And unfortunately, he is not who I consider my most brilliant student. My most brilliant student had a 2.9 GPA. You may be saying 2.9, are you crazy? This student, when she wrote an essay, I mean, I got the goosebumps immediately. I was like, this essay is gonna get her wherever she wants. But why was her GPA so low? She thought in her mind, she had to take every honors class she could imagine, every AP course she could imagine, do every extracurricular she could imagine. By the time junior year came, she was just embodied with anxiety and she was just being crushed because she was putting this heavy weight on her shoulders and her GPA was absolutely taking that beating. And so unfortunately, if the GPA is the number one thing they look at, we have to figure out ways to balance things. So I know that if you're a senior, you're thinking, great, where were you three and a half years ago? It's never too late. Think about your, your schedule and say, is this schedule gonna crush my, my, just my life in general? Am I not gonna smile anymore? And I'm going to be so focused and I'm going to end up with a 3.2. Maybe I can not take AP Econ, but take Math 3 Honors, right? Start thinking about things that you're really strong with. All right. Finally, what you guys came for, test scores, SATs and ACTs. First of all, let's put some perspective on them. Why do these tests matter? These tests matter because colleges want to see how much you've learned in college. With that said, there are, I'm sorry, colleges want to see how much you've learned in high school. So they're trying to, in a way, gauge how much you've been able to be receptive throughout the last few years of school. What's the difference with, it, with them and why do we have to think about both? The SAT is meant to kind of be thought of as an aptitude exam, which means it's, it's very analytical and critical thinking. Every math problem is a word problem. It's a real life situation. And they're trying to see if you can take the skills you've learned from school and adopt them to real life situations to see how ready you are for critical thinking levels that we're gonna be going into college. And so that, that exam from just a perspective, the, the questions are very challenging. Great, does that mean the ACT is easier? Not necessarily. Material wise, I would say it is. Material wise, it is not testing you based on these modeling questions and critical thinking. It's just testing you on your knowledge. So math questions usually are just equations. Perfect, right? Then that's the one I'm taking. The problem with that is the ACT is very fast. So there are 60 math questions in 60 minutes, which means you have one minute per question. And I don't know about you guys, but the moment someone puts a clock on you, these pawns start to get a little more sweaty and you start to get a little more anxious and then you start to rush and make more mistakes. On the SAT, you have about a minute and 30 per question. 30 seconds is a long time. If I just stayed here, quiet for 30 seconds and stared into this camera, it's going to get pretty awkward because 30 seconds could be a long time. So let yourself navigate both. What that means is take the PSAT every chance your school offers it and find somewhere that offers free ACTs if possible. And if you can't find either one, then hello, here's TutorZone, which sounds like a plug, but we offer SATs and ACTs for free all year round. All you have to do is call us up, send us an email and say, hey, can I come in and take an SAT or an ACT? And I'll say, for sure. Why? Because I don't think you should pay anyone to sit there and watch you take a test for three hours. All we do is reserve a space for you, a room, and just come in and say, okay, go. At the end of the hour, when the break's supposed to come in, we'll say, hey, take a five minute break. It's practically like taking the real test because these tests are usually sold by the college board and the ACT to companies like ours who need to have more resources so we can figure out a way to help you do better. Um, but I will send you a detailed score breakdown after. Obviously, if one day you decided to do some prep, hopefully you'll remember Tutor Zone. But if not, at least you'll be able to compare your scores and say, wow, I'm actually way better on one than the other. Let me forget about this test. How do you know which one you're better at? 
So we do live in the United States, which is very capitalistic and driven by business. And the College Board and the ACT are businesses. So they are trying to separate themselves and make themselves look as different as possible to hopefully confuse you a little bit and have you take both. Okay, so what does that mean? That means that the SAT is out of 1600 and the ACT is out of 36. How in the world do you compare those two? Here's the easiest way, I think. Find their averages. What was the college bound average last year? For an SAT, the, the typical student that got into college, everywhere from Cal States to UCs to Harvard, they averaged it all out and it was a 1083. For the ACT, it was a 21. So that's the average. Ideally, that's where we want to get to and hopefully overcome that and go above it. So if you take the SAT and you get a thousand, but you take the ACT and you get a 22, that tells you that the ACT is much more equipped for you. Maybe time is not a challenge for you. Maybe you're really good with speed and therefore you excel more in the ACT. So that is a really good number to remember. I would highly recommend you guys to write those down right now. Um, or always you can look them up. But again, remember the averages so you know. If you get a 1083 on the SAT and a 21 on the ACT, you're right at the average. Pick whichever one you like more, whichever experience was easier for you, and go for it. Here are other some uh, very unique differences between both exams. The SAT does not have any science in it. It's just math and English. The ACT has a science section. Sweet, I'm gonna be a doctor one day, biology was my thing, I'm taking the ACT. Unfortunately, the science section does not test you in biology, chemistry, physics, anatomy, or any other science class you could imagine. So what science class are they testing me on? It's not science, it's scientific data. So what they're trying to see is how well you can analyze data and answer questions based on that. But that data is all scientific data. So it'll be experiments that they did and they'll, they'll uh, put a chart with statistics and so on. And they want you to compare experiment A and experiment B. What it does is it has a lot of scientific vocabulary. So people who tend to struggle with vocabulary that they haven't seen before, freak out a little bit and then they forget and they try to start trying to figure out what the word actually means when in reality it has nothing to do with the data that they're presenting to you. How does the ACT or the SAT test for that? The SAT has a, a math section called data analysis. So instead, to try to kind of puzzle you a little bit and, and not let you figure out what the similarities are, they call it science and the other one calls it data analysis. It's practically the same thing, except on the SAT, it's a bunch of charts, a bunch of graph, a bunch of statistics trying to get you to answer questions based on that, but they're not scientific vocabulary based. They're more like math based. So again, those are not very unique differences. Anybody who works at a private tutoring place that tells you, you'll be so much more equipped for the ACT without ever seeing you take one is trying to sell you something. So be cautious and say, great, I would love to sign up for your SAT or ACT program. May I take both tests for free first, please, so that we can see the averages. Um, what are some other unique differences? I would say that the writing and the reading are very similar. Um, but here's one big one. Geometry is one fourth of the math portion in the ACT. So if you're very geometry based and you think you did very well in that class, you may do a little better on the ACT. Geometry is only 5% of the SAT, which means they don't do a lot of geometry. So what is in the SAT math? Algebra is 66% of the tests, about two thirds of it. Algebra one and algebra two. So if you're very linear and you're very algebra based, then the SAT might be a better choice for you. Again, I would never sit here and tell you which one is without seeing you actually take two scores because I think that is the best way to do it. So if you're a freshman, sophomore, or junior, the time is here to start thinking like, where can I take these tests? Luckily, again, you get a chance to do the PSAT at school. My recommendation is if you decide to pay for any prep at all, always prep for the SAT because the SAT is more challenging. It's more rigorous in the questions and take that test and then later take the ACT as well because I think the ACT will feel a little easier and hopefully you'll have some good strategies that you'll be able to manage the time much better. Um, to relieve stress again, just take both. Okay, 
Here's a few other components to this SAT conversation. Um, there's something called choice, score choice, which on the college board, you can pick which colleges you send it to. So the moment you take an SAT doesn't mean that they're gonna all see it. Like all the colleges are not gonna see it immediately. It's up to you to actually send it to the colleges one day. So does that mean that I only wanna send the best score? Well, this is directly from the UC website. So let me read it out loud and give you some perspective. The UC say, there is no benefit to the student using score choice. When all scores are submitted, the UCs will use the highest score from a single test administration for selection purposes. However, individual section scores that are higher may be used to clear subject area deficiencies or meet other requirements such as entry level writing or English proficiency. What does all that mean? As a Spanish speaker first, I was an ESL student and when I went to college, I was about to sign up for English 100 and they said, you must take English 50. And I was like, English 50, I don't even think I get credits for that. They're like, no, you don't because you have some deficiencies in English. So you got to take that English 50 before you get to English 100. But if I would have done really well on the SAT English portion and I would have scored above 500, the UCs and Cal States are saying that if you submit that, they will waive that English 50 and let you go right into English 100. If you don't think that's a big deal, it is, especially if you're paying for school because every class you pay for counts, right? And so you're also saving yourself time, which means I would recommend that you just submit all scores. There is uh, some private colleges that are thinking about doing super scores, which means they'll take your best math section and combine it with your best English, even if they're from different exams and create one super score. At the end of it, you gotta submit all scores for them to be able to do that. So again, I recommend you send them all. Does it look bad if you started with 1,000 and now you're at 1,200? I wouldn't think so. I mean, do you look down upon me because I had to take English 50? Hopefully you're thinking, wow, your English is pretty good. You've grown a lot. Well, yeah, I think the same thing about students who start with 1,000 and then get a 1,200. I look at that, I'm like, man, you're a hard worker. Like you figured out a way to overcome things. And I think colleges look the same. They don't look down upon you because you've got 1,000 your junior year. They see growth. So allow them to see that. Which, by the way, I forgot to mention that, the UCs also think very similarly about your GPA, which is why they don't actually look at freshman year. If you're sitting there thinking like, great, my freshman year was horrible, then hopefully, if you're a senior, a junior, or sophomore, you've grown since that year. You've shown that you've improved. If you're a freshman sitting in, or a coming, incoming freshman sitting here thinking like, yes, I'm about to take a year off, you better hit the brakes real quick because that's only the UCs, Cal States and every private school take into account your freshman year. And we don't know what we're doing in terms of college when we're freshmen. So don't make assumptions that you're gonna end up doing this specific path because life changes. All right, very well. Some perspective, most of us have heard of UC, USC, I'm sorry. Every time I talk to my students and they say, I say like, hey, where do you wanna go to school? USC is usually one they throw at, Here's something I highly recommend because um, I always ask the question, oh, tell me why you want to go to USC. And I've gone in very often because it's very a prestige, because their football teams usually ranked in the top 25% or 25 in the, in the country and so on. Um, those aren't really good answers. Prestige is kind of just like hype sometimes. And the fact that the football team is great has nothing to do with your degree. So empower yourself with information. I usually follow that question with like, oh, would you like to go to one of the Pomona colleges? And they always look at me like, the what colleges? Because a lot of us haven't heard about the Pomona colleges, which is fair, which means we would not go there just because we never heard of it. We shouldn't, we shouldn't make assumptions based on just what we've heard, especially if what we hear is just from Instagram or from just our friends. Let's try to really become empowered, which today is a great step. I commend you guys for being here today and joining this college fair because the information is what empowers you. Remember what I said way back in the beginning, I took Spanish one because I had no idea what I should be doing. I lack the information. So take advantage now, start going on virtual tours in this moment so you can become more knowledgeable about the schools. Navigate the website to see what majors they offer and how the majors are different than other schools. But back to the SAT conversation, average SAT scores for a school like USC range somewhere between 1270 to 1500. 
which means you want to be somewhere in that vicinity if you want to have a really good shot of getting into USC. The ACT is somewhere between a 30 to a 33. So those are the average ranges. That's where you want to be if you want to have a good shot to get into a school like this. Then there's Cal State Fullerton, which is a Cal State, which is meant for us to be able to hopefully have an easier chance of getting in. Uh, the total score for Cal State in terms of SAT is somewhere between a 930 and an 1130. Okay, so obviously you see a big difference there. The ACT is somewhere between a 19 and a 24. If you're thinking, wow, Cal State Fullerton must not be a good school because look at the difference between them and USC. I would caution you and let you know that private schools care a lot more about SATs and ACT scores. Why? Because private schools like USC, Biola, Sousa Pacific, they're businesses and they do run a lot based on um, that prestige idea that you're talking about, which is kind of a brand and somewhat marketing. And so usually when people hear that the average SAT is a 1300, immediately they think it's a great school and academically they want to get in there. Um, but again, Cal State Fullerton is a great school. It's all about you finding your fit. Here's a crazy number. There are more than 2,200 four-year colleges in the United States. And 65% of students that apply every year get in. Wow. I mean, if you're sitting there, like if you're freaking out before this conversation, you should be thinking right now, like the odds are forever in my favor. They are. 65% of you should just know that you should be getting into school. Now it's about finding that right fit for you. And what I say is 2,200, where do I start? Yes, there's a lot of colleges. And I'm going to give you guys some perspective before this conversation is over on how to create a good college list. But again, these are just some averages. For some of you who are crazy academic, I will come back to that other slide, but I would recommend taking some subject tests if you can, if you wanna get into like MIT or some of these crazy academic driven colleges, which are amazing. Um, but you have to then start to build your resume even more to separate yourself and to tell that story. And so there's something called the subject test, which are one hour long exams. You can take them any day that you hear the college board is having an SAT. And these are one hour trying to test you on one subject. So there at the bottom, you would see that there's a math. There's usually a math one, a math two. If you want to go to MIT, you got to take math two because it's got to be the upper echelon math uh, students. There's biology, physics, chemistry, literature, U.S. history, every Spanish class you could imagine. I should have taken the Spanish test. I would have killed it on that. Again, no one told me this. So luckily for you guys, now you're like, okay, I know I should be doing this. You can take it as early as ninth grade. Why would you want to take it as a freshman? Oh, that's right. Most of us take biology freshman year. So instead of waiting till like senior year and then saying like, I should take bio, but I haven't seen it in three years, you take bio and you're like, I killed it this year. My teacher was awesome. She was so tough and I got an A. I better take the biology now that it's fresh in my mind. These scores are out of 800. Usually a good score is about a 650. Those are the ones that tells you that this person is very like biology driven or they they mastered chemistry or so on. Okay, COVID impact on this whole college conversation. I, I, I have to commend, to be honest with you guys, the UCs. And I think that's why we're blessed. The UCs have been way up in the forefront in the United States, putting out there like new regulations and then most of the colleges just following them. Early on in April, immediately the UCs came out and said that they were gonna allow pass or fail or credit or no credit class uh, scores to be part of the A through G requirements. If you're thinking, what, are, what, is, what is this guy talking about? For many years, A through G requirements, which are the classes you have to take to be able to be eligible for a Cal State or a UC, like his, two years of history, four years of English, three years of math, so on or so on, you had to have a letter grade, an A through uh, F. And if you got an F or a D, they didn't count. But then we got hit with this COVID circumstance and we all went to online school and many of us didn't have the technology and it became a completely unlevel and unfair playing field, right? Because students who lived in places where they had the most amazing technology in the world and teachers were teaching and everything. And some of us who didn't no longer were on the level equal playing field. So UCs came out and said that, and within three weeks, so did the school districts. The school districts came out and said, oh, by the way, 
you can now get pass or fail or credit or no credit in case you were getting a B minus in the class and then COVID hit and suddenly you never got to see the teacher and it became very difficult and your grade dropped, it allowed you to take a pass. Colleges are saying that they're allowing that. I think that's very important. With that said, that means that most of us during junior year, our GPA now is weird, right? Because it's like a pass fail or credit or no credit and then a few grades. So I really believe that that, um, that second semester for most of you guys of last year, whether you were a junior, a sophomore, so on, so meaning, the second semester of your 2019-2020 school year is really not going to be a big part of the GPA. And the colleges understand that. We were all, we are all trying to navigate this world, especially you guys as students. And so they know that and they can't take too much and carry that heavy weight. With that said, the SAT and the ACT became the same conversation. The UCs immediately came out and said that the SAT and ACT now was optional. Quickly within a week, the Cal State system came out and said the same thing. And then within another week, like 50 other big colleges came out and said the same thing. The UCs are at the forefront. I would highly recommend that you sign up for their newsletter if you wanna be in contact. That's usually what I do. And usually when I read about stuff from them, then I'll hear about all the other colleges coming through in the next few weeks. So what does that mean? It's optional. Well, here's the truth. If you just wanna to go to a Cal State or a UC, and you are going to be an incoming senior, I want to make that clear, an incoming senior, you don't have to take those tests. They are not a part of the college application process for incoming seniors who are going to apply to UCs and Cal States soon. I've prefaced that by saying UCs and Cal States. There is a list of many other colleges, private schools, out-of-state schools that have come out and said the same thing, but not all of them have. So I'm saying that if you for sure only apply to Cal States and UCs, then forget about the SAT and ACT. Unless you've taken it before and, you, and you've killed it. Because if you did amazing, then it's like another great thing to put on your uh, resume that you want to show off. But if you're like, yeah, you know, my PSAT was not all that, so I'm going to go ahead and forget about it. That's totally cool. And there's no way that a student can get a, a bonus point for taking the SAT versus another one who didn't in terms of the UCs and Cal States. I'd highly recommend the rest of you seniors, if you're applying to a private school or a out of state school to actually like email their counselor and just ask, do I need to take the SAT or the ACT? A lot of private schools do care about these tests because it helps them with, like I told you guys, raise the prestige and it also helps with scholarships. So like if you were to go to Biola, you literally can go on the Biola website right now, put your GPA, put your SAT score, and it'll tell you immediately how much scholarship money you'll get. I do, I do this with students all the time. I'll say you get 12,000, 15,000, 18,000, because they do it based on numbers. And then obviously they might offer you more when they read your essays and so on. But if you're just for sure Cal State, UCs, forget about those tests and focus on your essays. So with GPAs now being a little watered down because of pass or fail, and with us not having to take the SAT or the ACT, if we're going to UCs and Cal States, how in the world are they going to figure out who deserves to get in? Your essays have just become forever more important because the essays are the only place where you're no longer a number, where you're not a 3.5 GPA and a 1200 SAT. Now you get a chance to really tell a story about you. And I love the essays because I think that's where you can really make an impact. I'm going to go through the essays fairly quickly, but again, these changes are committed for the spring 2020 and the fall 2020 for seniors, juniors, sophomores, hang in there, kind of like make sure you keep navigating this conversation. The UCs within a few weeks came out and just got rid of the SAT into 2024. If you are 100% sure you're going to a UC, um, I would still not preface that unless you're in the top 9% because otherwise it's going to be tough. But if you just know that, then you can forget about the SAT for good because they are done with the SAT and the ACT until 2024 when they're going to come out with their own standardized testing. It's really interesting. The UCs are trying to get done with this test. I'm not a huge proponent of the standardized testing either. And I'll preface that as a company who actually survives quite often as having college prep, SAT prep, ACT prep. But I just believe you can have a bad day. Like what if you just, you know, had a bad day, woke up with a fever that day, 
or maybe you are an English language learner and you don't have this crazy vocabulary that they use in these tests. There's just a lot of things that really don't have an equal playing field in, in the standardized testing and the UCs know that. And so that's why they're, they're done with this test. And I really believe that the rest of the colleges will follow eventually. When, who knows, the College Board and the ACT are doing everything they can not to, um, but we'll see. So we talked about subject tests. Now we finally are talking about extracurricular activities. Most of you are probably thinking like, this guy hasn't even talked about extracurriculars. And I will preface this by saying, I have never seen more high school students stressed out about how difficult it is to get into college. You're right, it is tough, but you should also remember that number I threw out. 65% of you will get in. So remember that if you do the, the application process correctly, you should have a really good chance of getting in. But extracurriculars are towards the back end. And where they really make an impact is on the essays, because you're gonna talk about all these extracurriculars. So it's not so much that you did volunteer hours at the hospital, 100 hours, it's what you learned from those 100 hours, right? And so if you sat there and all you did was like, welcome to the hospital, have a great day, it's that way, the emergency room's that way, and you can just say that it was the most boring experience and you learned nothing, those hours aren't gonna mean that much. But if you got to know people, if you experienced talking to them, if you were able to like walk through the, the tour and kind of get to know them, help them navigate this experience, and you learn about people skills and communication, then those essays become very meaningful. So colleges always say this, it's not about breadth. I can't even tell you guys how many breaths I've taken since I started talking, probably in the millions and I'm running out right now because I'm excited, but it's about depth. Did I say anything in these last 45 minutes that caught your attention and that was meaningful enough for you to remember? And that's what the colleges care about too. They don't want you to do 50 extracurriculars. They're okay with you doing two or three, but make them meaningful. Colleges seek angled students. If you're in geometry or have taken geometry, you know that 180 degree angle is like a straight line. So imagine that I was a sprinkler and I was 180 degree sprinkler, right? Like I could water half of the lawn. But if I became like a 15 degree sprinkler, the rest of the lawn is gonna die, but that small portion that I really get to water, it's gonna blossom tremendously. And that's what they want to see. They wanna see you be passionate, and curious about things and chase them. Why they believe that? Because colleges know that they have the endless resources and they know that they will have a club, an internship for everything and anything. And they want you to get there and take advantage of things and be curious about learning and be very passionate about things and chase them. So that's what they're looking for. All right, I'm running out of time. So let me finish with this, your college list. Be very intentional about how you do your college list. I know that it's expensive. So I remember my mom telling me, here is 50 bucks, get into college. And I was like, whoa, 50 bucks, man, that's, that's awesome. And so I didn't know that there was fee waivers. Luckily for you guys, there are fee waivers. If you get free reduced lunch, or you just wanna ask like, hey, counselor, do I get a fee waiver? If you were to get one, you get four free Cal States and four free UCs. Are you kidding me? That's eight great schools for free. Apply to eight of them, that'd be awesome. But if you're not fortunate to have the fee waiver, then you do have to pay for them. So you wanna be very strategic. I would highly recommend this way. Dream big, you gotta be a dreamer. Like I believe in, like believe in big things. When I was 21 years old and I started this company as just tutoring everyday students, I still believe that one day we were gonna be able to do college fairs for students and talk to them about things that I didn't hear about. And here I am today, not because I'm any better, but just because I think if we dream and work hard, we can make it. So dream, if you love USC, if you love the Pomona colleges, go for it. The worst part that can happen is they say no and they lose out. So pick a few reach schools, schools that are above your averages in terms of GPAs and SATs, but go for it. But make sure then you pick a few middle range schools. Middle range schools are schools where you're right in their sweet spot. You have a 3.5 GPA and their average is like a 3.6. You got a 900 on your PSAT and their average is like a 950. Pick a few that you're right in the sweet spot because most likely they're like 50-50.
meaning you have a really good shot of getting in, but also a shot of not getting in. For example, depending on where you live, Cal State Fullerton may be your home school. If you live within 10 miles of Cal State Fullerton, so if you have a 3.6, and I have a 3.6, but I live in Fresno, you get in and I don't because you get an extra bonus point for living within a 10 mile radius because that's your home Cal State, because Cal States are meant to be commuter schools. So they want people who drive there. On the other hand, if I live like in Artesia and Cal State Long Beach is my home school and I have a 3.5 and you have a 3.5, but you live in Orange County, I got a better shot of getting in. So those are like your middle range schools. Those are like 50, 50 shots, but most likely pick schools that you're almost for sure gonna get into. You got a 3.6 GPA, and you look up Cal Baptist and their average is a 3.2, you know, you got a really good shot of getting in there. Why you want to do that is because of a few reasons. It lowers your stress. The UCs and the Cal States are not going to tell you if you got in or not until like April, late March. That's really late. You have to submit your uh, submission letter by May 15th. So you're like sitting at home, like freaking out. Am I going to get in? And then if you apply to some slam dunk schools, they'll let you know right away within like January or, April or February. So you can be sitting back waiting for UCLA to tell you yes or no, but at least in your back pocket, you have Cal Baptist and Biola, right? That'd be nice, it would help. Also, usually the slam dunk schools for you are the ones that are gonna give you a lot of scholarship money. Because if you're above the averages, then you're gonna make their schools look really good. And so therefore they will throw crazy money at you. I told you guys earlier that I went to the Cal States. I have a brother who is 29 and he has a PhD and he teaches at Cal State Fullerton. Super young, right? Crazy. Um, he went to Whittier College and he got a $50,000 Greenleaf scholarship. I didn't really get any scholarships at the Cal States because the Cal States are super impacted. They're not gonna give you a lot of money, but some of the private schools will. So don't be afraid of private schools because they're so expensive. They tend to throw a lot of money your way my brother got a lot of money because he raised the GPA and the uh, SATs because he was a little bit above their averages. Also, what's great about private schools is the fact that you have really small classroom settings. So my brother went and got his PhD right out of his undergrad because he was practically best friends with all the professors at Whittier College because he had classes with like six students. They went to like, they would go to lunch all the time. And I was like, how are you like texting and best friends with your professors? That's great. That network is awesome. Uh, because it leads you to some opportunities. At the same time, I was at Cal State. I don't know how many of my professors knew my name. I had classes with like 50 or 100 students. But the fact that I was really hard and go-getter, I was able to still do well there, right? And so if you think that you tend to be more quiet, you like small kind of classrooms, you excel in that setting, then you want to put some private schools in your list. Two middle, two rich schools, two middle range schools, two slam dunk schools. That would be a great list. But if you have more, then do three, 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 four, 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 but keep it balanced, right? That's the way you should approach it. All right, I am probably gonna stop now because I'm running out of breaths or I'm running out of voice. I get too excited when I do this. Here is my information for any of you guys who would like to one day reach out with any questions. Um, reminder, I am forever happy to help you guys. Just tell me you saw my video at the college fair. It'll be kind of like a free. Um, I do have a college coaching program, but I don't really like to promote our business. Um, if you want to know about it, just go to tutor-zone.com. If you feel like you got a lot of good information today and you just wish that you can keep getting this information, I would follow our Instagram. Um, we do that all the time. So it's just at Tutor Zone. Here's my personal information. You're welcome to email me. Those are our numbers and our website uh, for any questions that you may have. Uh, and I promise you that if you just tell me it was at the college fair, I'll share with you as much information as I can for free because I remember what it's like not to have a lot of that. Thank you guys so much for your time. Hope you get a lot of other good information at the rest of the webinars.